Hello everyone uh, and welcome. My name is Luca. I'm a PhD student at University of Zurich. Today I will present work that I did in collaboration with my supervisor, Professor Igor Scholtes. The talk is about detecting the Markov order of paths in a graph. Um, first, um, let's get some intuition about paths in a graph. Uh, in abstract, we first have a graph that, represent, uh, that represents the topology of the underlying system and paths, which are represented here in red and orange, um, are sequences of nodes that are generated by some process that is running along the edges of the graph. Uh, in practice, the graph can represent social network and paths can represent how information spreads, or alternatively, the graph can represent uh, the internet pages interconnected by hyperlinks and paths can represent click streams that web users produced while navigating the web. There are other examples outside of the web domain, like transportation systems, where paths represent passenger routes. Uh, the simplest way to model such data is by using a static network representation and assuming that the process is Markovian, uh, which means that the next node depends only on the current node and not on the nodes that have been visited in the past. Uh, unfortunately, um, many works have found non-Markovian paths. And to address this issue, um, we could use higher order and variable order Markov chains, which are regularly used to model long sequences like DNA or text. But pathway data often consist of large number of short paths, which is in contrast with a single long sequence uh, like DNA or text. Uh, the issue has been identified and addressed by Scholtes in 2017, uh, where he introduced multi-order network models. Um, multi-order network models um, consist of layers of the brewing graphs, which allow them to model large number of short paths. On the left, you see a multi-order network model of order three. Uh, now let's take one path, C, A, B, C, A. Um, and let's see uh, how would we model it with this third order mon model. Um, the first transition from C to A would be modeled with the first layer. Uh, it is shown in green color. Uh, the next transition from A to B would be modeled as a second order transition, C A to A B, and it would be modeled with the second uh, layer, which is shown here in purple. Uh, all other steps are modeled with the third last or order, and the resulting path is shown in the red. Um, you can see that these models are tailored uh, for large number of short non-Markovian paths uh, because the first few steps are modeled explicitly. Uh, the problem of this method is the inference. First, uh, the method uses maximum likelihood estimation to infer the probabilities, which are the parameters of the model. Uh, it does not leverage the information of constraints. And second, which is a consequence of the previous problem, uh, to determine the optimal order, the method assumes that all links are observed at least once, um, which does not have to be the case in real applications. Uh, the first question is how to infer models for paths and leverage both the information of constraints and the pathway data. Uh, and once we have such an inference model, we have to compare how sensitive it is to detect the Markov order, which is the issue of model selection. Uh, we should compare it to the likelihood ratio test, which has been used to select the order of the multi-order network models, uh, and to AIC and BIC, which are often used for Markov chains and which can be adapted to multi-order network models as well. Um, finally, uh, the results uh, should also be tested for robustness, uh, but due to time constraints, I will not discuss this part of uh, our work in the talk. So the first question is, 
how can we infer multi-order network models and include the topological constraints in the inference? Uh, to answer this question, we applied Bayesian learning. Uh, in Bayesian learning, we do not model the parameters as point estimates. We keep track of whole distributions of the parameters. Uh, in this case, the parameters are transition probabilities. Uh, we encode the topological information in the prior distribution of the parameters. Let me show you how it works uh, in this toy example. Um, so in the figure, I present an underlying graph constraint and let's take a path CA. Uh, the next step can be either C or B. It cannot be F, for example, because there is no connection from A to F. Uh, we denote the transition probabilities, which are the parameters of the model as uh, pi's. Um, all transition probabilities, which are forbidden by the underlying graph constraint, are assumed to be a priori distributed as Dirac delta function. In other words, they are fixed to zero and we do not need to keep track of them. The remaining parameters, like the transition probabilities from CA to B and to C, form vectors that live in the probability simplex. We assume a constant uniform distribution over the probability simplex. The rest of the inference is standard. Um, for a given pathway data D, we compute the posterior using Bayes rule, and the posterior is a Dirichlet distribution which is analytically tractable. And um, the last formula, formula represents the update rule for the parameters of the posterior distribution. Um, the detection of the optimal order follows the same spirit. A priori, we assume a uniform distribution over the possible orders k, and it is not necessary to penalize more complex models uh, additionally because this method naturally incorporates Occam's razor. Um, we again compute the posterior with the base rule. Um, and now to select the single order, um, we use hypothesis tests called base factors from Kass and Raftery. Uh, they define base factor as ratio of probabilities. Um, we select the order K, which is significantly more likely than all lower orders. Um, we use two levels of significance threshold, uh, both from Kass and Raftery. Uh, one is positive evidence and the other one is very strong evidence. Um, we ran synthetic experiments. Uh, to test the performance of the base factor method versus uh, the likelihood ratio test um, and versus the AIC and BAC, which we apply to multi order network models. To generate the graph constraint, we use Erdos-Renyi random graph with 100 nodes and 350 edges. Um, to generate pathway data, uh, we ran a process with second order correlations. Uh, on this network, and um, uh, both the graph constraint and the pathway data are used as inputs for the model selection methods. Uh, the output of each experiment is uh, the detected order, um, and we vary the size of the pathway data uh, and observe the frequency that each method will select a given order. And for each data size, we ran hundreds of experiments to determine those frequencies. So let's look at the results. Uh, and let's look at the likelihood ratio first. Uh, the significance threshold of the test is 5%. Um, on x-axis, we have the size of the data. On y-axis, we have the probability to select a given order with the likelihood ratio test. The curves represent orders one to four. Uh, dotted blue is order one. Solid orange curve is order two. Um, and this is the correct order. So when this curve is one, the method found the correct, uh, always finds the correct order. And three and four, uh, orders three and four are dashed gray curves. 
uh, the transparent holes around curves represent the confidence intervals. Uh, now, pardon. Um, what we see for the curve of order one, it dominates the plot when there is not enough data to detect the second order. Um, at some point, uh, there is enough data to detect the correct order. Uh, and this is where the orange curve rises. And we would expect it to settle around 95% because the significance threshold is 5%. Um, the significance threshold should nominally correspond to the type 1 uh, error rate, and type 1 error rate is the probability to select the order larger than the correct one, so uh, orders 3 and 4. Um, however, this is not the case. Uh, we detect order 3 with probability larger than 50%, uh, which means we have a case of overfitting. Um, we can now take a look at the plots of um, all methods. Uh, top middle is the likelihood ratio test that we just discussed. Underneath is the likelihood ratio test with 0.1% significance threshold. And we again see the overfitting. Uh, on the right, we have AAC and BAC that we apply to multi order network models. And on the left, we have base factor method with significance threshold of positive and very strong evidence. Um, we note that none of these methods shows uh, overfitting, but we see that they differ in terms of uh, minimal size of the data that is required to detect the correct order. Um, the green shading shows the range of data uh, where the method detects the correct order. Uh, and in the next plot, we will show these intervals only. So in figure A, we see the intervals uh, from the previous graphic on x-axis um, we again have data sizes but on y-axis we plotted different methods um, so the differences in terms of data efficiency are huge note that x-axis has logarithmic scale so that means that base factors are two orders of magnitude better than BIC and they are one order of magnitude better than AIC and likelihood ratio test. Uh, in figure B, we see that um, the results also hold when the ground truth order is three. So the uh, experiments in real data show why these insights are, are important. Uh, we tested in four clickstream data sets and two data sets in transportation systems. The clickstream data sets are from uh, FIFA, Gazelle, Wikipedia, and MSNBC uh, websites, and the transportation websites are of flight and uh, so US flights and um, London tube passengers. We show the number of nodes and the number of edges of the underlying graphs, and we show the number of observations of transitions in the pathway data, uh, and K with the bar. Uh, represents the maximal order that we tested for each data set. Um, on the right side, you see what order was detected uh, by each of the methods. Uh, these tests also find that base factors are the most sensitive. And we can also see in MS and BC data that the likelihood ratio test overfits the order. Of course, we cannot know the ground truth order in the real world data, but given that every other method finds order two uh, and likelihood ratio finds order three, and given that uh, we found in what we found in synthetic data, we can be fairly confident that likelihood ratio test overfits in this case. And to sum up, um, we derived the Bayesian method to infer the parameters of the multi order network models and we investigated the uh, model selection techniques um, with base factors. Um, we experimentally tested the methods in synthetic data and found that base factor methods uh, needs orders of magnitude less data than the maximum likelihood methods. Uh, we also found both in synthetic and web data that the likelihood ratio test overfits the true order. And finally, 
uh, the uh, a Python implementation of all methods are freely available. And with that, I would like to open the floor for questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Luca. Uh, I, uh, Luca happens to be here in the chat. Um, so uh, do people have any questions for Luca? Uh, okay, well, I have a question. Uh, so uh, what I found was, that was uh, surprising was that more data would create a uh, uh, an overfitting condition. Um, could you help under help me understand that? Why would more data actually uh, give us the wrong value for k? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. So that happens only for the likelihood ratio test. I see. Um, likelihood ratio test um, is performed here. So for likelihood ratio test, you have test statistic. Um, which is uh, for which you have to know the distribution. Mm -hmm. um, to do the likelihood ratio test in this case, um, Bilk's theorem is used, which gives a distribution, key square distribution, which is the which is approximating the true distribution. Unfortunately, uh, for Bilk's theorem, you have to assume that data is infinite, mm -hmm. but data is not infinite. So there is this regime where there is enough data um, that you can uh, overrule the second order, but the Vilk, there is not yet enough data to be able to apply Vilk's theorem. So it's actually the problem of this approximation in the Vilk's theorem. And that's why more data makes the first creates the overfitting. And then afterwards, you will see that the curve um, goes back to where it should. So in the regime of infinite data, it would settle around uh, basically 95% in this case because the significance threshold was 5%. So it's kind of a consequence of the um, not being in the limit of large enough data. I see, I see. That's very interesting. I hope that answers the question. Yes, yes, it does, absolutely. Um, and in the final uh, couple minutes, I, I did have one more question, but before I ask it, I just want to double check if anyone has any other questions. Uh, all right, if, if no one else does, uh, the other question I had was, um, in many of these data sets, I think you're limited by um, the, I mean, I think reconstructing the order K um, is I would assume a, sort of a, a process that demands a lot of data, which means it wouldn't necessarily scale up to very, very large networks. I was noticing your largest networks, while some had many edges, they were always under 10,000 nodes. Um, are there ways, do you believe that one could be able to extend this work into uh, large networks, let's say 100,000 nodes? Uh, this was... This was the idea with the constraints. So unfortunately, the, the data sets that are freely available online, um, although some have a lot of um, click streams, they do not have available um, constraints that were present online. So these data sets are the ones where I could get the constraints, the rough constraints underlying the, the process as as well as the clickstream data uh, on top of it. So the idea here would be if you want to have, if you want to detect the order K for a very large graph, you would have to measure, so to, to see what the graph is and to see what the clickstreams are. And then combining the two, you would have much better inference of the, of the, of the mark of order K. Um, of course, the, the sparser the network is, the less degrees of freedom, and therefore the easier it is to detect the, the higher orders um, of higher mark of orders of the process. I see. I see. Thank you. Um, I'm noticing this uh, 740. Uh, it's it's 
uh, 15 before the hour, um, which is to say we're out of time. Um, so if, if people want to leave, uh, they're absolutely welcome to. Um, but, uh, and Luca, if you have to leave, uh, feel free to. Um, no, it's okay, I can, I can stay for some. Okay. More. Um, so, so just to add one question to that. Um, so um, uh, would this be applicable, for example, for Twitter? You know, so we have, we have um, a constraint in the topology by way of uh, followers and followees we would have the diffusion on the network. Um, and as I was mentioning previously, maybe the follower followers are not the, are, are sort of an upper bounds for the true constraint. Um, but would, would something like tweets on Twitter be a, an applicable um, data set for, for which to use this method? Um, I, I think they would. However, I did not have enough of the domain knowledge with the Twitter dataset to be able to pre-process it. Uh, especially as when I tried, I noticed that um, if I retweet what someone else retweeted, it would I would have in the data only the connection between me and the original person, um, which would not follow the constraint. So if I follow you and you follow, I don't know, someone, Elon Musk, uh, and I don't follow Elon Musk and I retweet your retweet of Elon Musk, then um, it would seem as if I got inf information from him directly. Uh, and that was violating the, the, the constraint. So I could not merge the two data sets. But I, I, I'm not sure whether now Twitter has different API in the meantime, I think it changed, but I think in general, it would be possible to, to use this uh, methodology. In fact, I, I even thought that we could maybe separate what we got through the graph constraint from what we got from the search function of Twitter because a search function does not obey constraints. Yeah, yeah. That's a... That's a mm -hmm. um, I, I think the way one would be able to reconstruct it would be by if you knew who you were following um, and then you'd be able to see how those retweets uh, evolved over time. Uh, I, I don't know the details because I haven't worked directly with that sort of thing. Um, but I think there are ways to reconstruct the actual path, um, and it, which goes beyond just using the simple Twitter API. Because in that case, you would be able to use it. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, with that, again, we're we're out of time. Uh, so I want to thank everyone. I especially want to thank um, uh, the the volunteer here who who was helping me all along, Alexander Benter, Bento. I'm sorry. Um, so if uh, if uh, no one has any other questions, I think we can end it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your presentations.